for the next few weeks, I'm going to be engaging um, you all in whatever groupings there are in a discussion about women and how they have shaped and defined um, resistance culture here in America. And so we're beginning tonight with Nina Simone in particular, because in 1963, Nina Simone uh, captures what is the uncertainty and um, the simmering anger that is beginning to build within the Black civil rights struggle. Um, two weeks after Dr. King gave his iconic speech um, in Washington at, for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama was bombed. In the basement of that church was four little girls who were in the women's lounge doing what little girls do uh, when little girls get together. They had no idea that on the opposite wall of that women's lounge, uh, Klansmen had attached and affixed dynamite. And so when that blast happened in the rubble, uh, these four bodies of these little girls were pulled out uh, and they be became a symbol of what would be a period of escalating violence in America directed toward those who were fighting for social and racial change in America. Nina Simone, who was one of the most well-known, well-paid black entertainers at that time was sitting in her living room. And she said that she was struck in that moment of hearing uh, her radio program be interrupted um, with the news broadcast about the bombing of this church. And she felt like this was her Damascus Road moment, that all that she had been trying to achieve, all that she had tried to embody in terms of the assimilation politics um, that surrounded you know, Black Americans' fight for social and racial justice had failed her. And so not being able to, uh, to actually embody the anger that she was feeling in a physical and violent way, she went to her piano. And she wrote one of the most poignant and pivotal songs of the civil rights movement, Mississippi Goddamn. I say it's poignant and it's, it is pivotal um, because it signifies what will be a change in resistance culture, what will be a change in protest music. Uh, it foreshadows what will be, as I said, uh, a growing wave of violence, but also a growing wave of militant resistance. And it marks really the end of a coalition between Dr. King and younger factions of the movement in the form of SNCC and CORE. Um, and it will foreshadow the kind of shift of the movement from this ideolo ideology of nonviolence to a more militant ideology advancing Black nationalists and Black power. And so we're starting with Nina because Nina in so many ways points to what becomes the Black power message song of the late 60s that we hear and we oftentimes reference only in male artists like James Brown, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, or uh, Curtis Mayfield, People Get Ready, uh, or uh, Sly Stone, uh, Everyday People, and, and a whole host of things. But really, she encapsulates what is this developing relationship between Black popular music and Black liberation ideology um, that, that fuels much of our popular culture into the late 20th century. So we're beginning here, but next week, we're going to shift back before Nina. So Nina is going to be one of our anchor points in this discussion in the mid 60s. But next week, we're going to go back and consider her foremothers in this fight for equality by looking at Odetta, by looking at white liberal uh, uh, activists in the form of Aunt Molly Jackson, who is voicing what is the disenfranchisement of, of whites in Appalachia through her protest ballots. We're gonna look at Billie Holiday in her poignant song, um, Strange Fruit. 
and how that provided an early template for Nina Simone. And then the following week, we're gonna talk about women in jazz. We oftentimes get caught up in the lyrical narratives of protest songs, and we don't consider what are the layered ways sonically in which protest resistance and the fight for change are articulated. So we're gonna to listen to some of the music of jazz performers and classical composers who took these same liberation narratives and embedded them in their music and try to bring and promote those messages of social change and racial equality into the spaces they inhabited. And then we're gonna end our discussion by looking at today. And what did the mythology of post-racialism that was fueled by Obama's election reveal to us about uh, passivity and, and this sense of comfort that was created because of the crossover of black music and the fact that black music and black culture has, has so much been a part of weaving the fabric of identity for the last 20, 30 years. And so in that, we're going to talk about how this mythology of post-racialism is really uh, destroyed with the murders of Trayvon Martin. Um, even with the murder, the recent murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And we're gonna talk about women's reactions uh, to Me Too and to uh, Black Lives Matter and all of these things. So we're going to, we're gonna have an expansive conversation, ladies, expansive conversation about the power of one's voice, as Mary said, because what we're gonna find in each of these idioms and each of these instances is that these women, were, were regular women just like us who used the very thing that they had at their disposal. Sometimes their voice, sometimes their instruments, sometimes their thoughts, sometimes their bodies to initiate conversations and initiate the movement towards social change. So the theme of this will all be about the power of one, one voice, one person, one song, one note, one word, and how those things can trigger a revolution. <laughs> 